build on another. You, you, by lowering standards and giving students higher grades, they may not get all the concepts that they need to be successful in the subsequent classes. And being an accounting instructor, it does me no good to take a D accounting 101 student and push them up into a C to pass them because they're just gonna struggle in 102. If they really need to repeat 101, I need to let them do that and be okay with that. Right, that's a good point. And I see the same thing. I teach math 110 and 111. And if students that take 111 have to have 110 before they can get to 111. So I've seen many students that I've had in 110 coming into my 111 class. And so I know if they're not getting the material, if they're not learning the material in 110, they're going to struggle in 111, just the same situation you're talking about. That's exactly right. Any other thoughts or consequences, what can happen if we lower the bar to give higher grades when students may not be earning those? All right. Exactly. Someone mentioned in the chat, uh, um, students of some instructors have a lower bar, then there is a lack of equity among all students. And that's exactly right. It goes along with both what Angela and I said. Um, if, depending on which instructor we're getting at, um, we may know, oh, they just came from um, John Smith's class. And John Smith gives them easy grades, gives them easy assignments. They're not, we're going to have to, we're going to, we know we're going to have struggles with students that come out of John Smith's class when they come to us or Sally Jones's class um, for that reason. That's exactly right. Someone else posted students have a false sense of preparedness. Um, that's exactly true. Um, they think they know the material. They've scored a good grade, but when they actually get there to do it, um, they may not be able to do the skills or, or, do the task that they need to be able to do. Um, so I'm supposed to gives a false sense that students would be successful in other courses. And that is exactly true as well, especially when courses build, right? As we all know, as we get closer to our, what we're majoring in or what we're doing, like engineering students, I teach math and engineering students that, that can't do trigonometry or geometry or some of those basic math skills, they're going to really struggle in their engineering classes. Um, someone who doesn't do well in biology is going to, anatomy and physiology is going to struggle when they get to their paramedic course or when they get to their nursing courses or things like that, um, and even carrying on for there. So that's exactly right. It gives them a false sense that they're going to be successful or that they're not even prepared. Um, good job, everyone. All right, so that's some of the consequences that we can see happening there. So <clears throat> here's where it comes important. And, and I've heard lots of instructors, I'm the Blackboard Administrator at Greenville Tech. So I pull lots of reports. I see lots of things. We're having to pull reports for the, for the high schools and things like that. And I'm seeing a lot of um, things going on in grade books um, that people don't realize. And so it's really important for us as instructors to maintain our grade books carefully, all right? Um, so the first thing, and this is kind of the backwards design or the backwards thinking, if you will, is how is your final grade gonna be calculated? Students should know this up front. It should be posted in the syllabus. It should be posted wherever. What is it? How are grades calculated, all right? I think I spell it out pretty clearly and I still get those questions from my students. I had a student last night that took his final exam and he, and he sent me an email and he said, he said, Mr. McMahon, I thought the final grade would, I mean, the final exam would replace one of our lowest test grades. Well, it does in the calculation. It doesn't actually overwrite that grade in the grade center, right? Um, you're still going to see that grade, that, that low test grade, but in the calculation, it does get replaced. And I kind of spelled that out and gave them the formula of how it's calculated at the beginning. Um, so, you know, having that posted and letting the students know is, is pretty important. Um, are you basing your grade on a total score? 
like you have a thousand possible points and each gradable item that you do is worth a, uh, a small fraction of that. And they build up and at the end of the semester, if they have a whatever percentage that is, they'll get an A, B, C um, or D. Um, so calculated columns, here's one thing that we found very important. This is a policy at Greenville Tech, and that is a student should be able to look at their my grades, look at their grades in the course at any point in the, within the course and know where they stand, how they're doing, all right? So when we do our calculated columns, <clears throat> that running average or total or weighted grade, whatever it is, needs to be set as a running total, right? If it's not set as a running total, all right, then basically it's comparing where they're at or where they should be at the end. And that's not a good comparison for a student because until they get into that point range where they're gonna get a C, B or, or an A, um, that may take more than half the semester before they complete enough assignments or whatnot to get their points or their weighted points up that high. Um, but by doing it as a running total, basically the grade book ignores the grades or doesn't count the grades if no grades have been posted, right? And you need to decide, as I mentioned already, are you doing a weighted, a total points, or an average, or some mixture of the two or three? Um, that should be pretty well known before you even start the course, all right? Um, again, I've already mentioned students should be able to see where they are at any point in the semester um, with your grades. Empty grade columns. This is a big thing. I mean, I know many of us are using Desire to Learn D2L. Um, some of us are on Blackboard. Um, we might have a, one or two that might be looking at Canvas or something else. Um, how are ungraded columns dealt with? Um, by using a running total in Blackboard, um, that's telling the, the calculated column not to include any columns that doesn't have a grade in it, right? So those are ignored. Um, <clears throat> some, if you make it not a running total, then all the columns that don't have a grade in it are counted as a zero. So up front, the student's in the hole. They've got a zero average, and that can be pretty depressing, right? So <clears throat> I know there's a setting in D2L where you can tell it one way or the other how to calculate those un ungraded columns. With that, though, comes the importance of putting grades in when they're due, right? Due dates become very important. <clears throat> I used to not put grades in for homework assignments, even though it counts 10% of their grade. I would let them work their homework, go back and do homeworks that they missed. Or if they wanted to try to improve their grade a little bit, they could go and do a homework that they may have scored low on um, at any time. So I would not put grades in until the last week of the semester for their homework assignment. I would leave those columns empty. But then Students thought homework didn't matter or they were doing okay on quizzes and tests. Why should I do the homework, even though it counts? When I went back in and put all those zeros in, their grade would drop, sometimes half a letter grade or a whole letter grade. And lots of students would get upset with that. So now at the end of each week, whenever homeworks are due or not, they can still go back and rework them, but I'm putting zeros in so they can see how it's impacting their grade. Um, and those things, and that's important. Even if a student's gonna make up a quiz or a test, if you allow that, you still need to put zeros in um, so students can see, oh, well, it's no big deal. It's not gonna hurt if I don't make up that test. Well, yeah, it does, because when they see what a zero does, it has a big impact on them. All right. Um, so that is, that's the main thing is we're, we're looking at here is talking about how, <clears throat> how do we deal with our grades, why it's important to um, maintain our grade center and <clears throat> put zeros in um, at due dates while due dates are very important. Any comments or thoughts from those of you here dealing with grades, dealing with missing grades, dealing with um, the importance of grades in your courses. 
<clears throat> this is kind of an open, an open part of it, open forum, if you will, and uh, time for you to share a little bit and um, <clears throat> ask any questions if you have them. I've got a question for the general posterity. Sure. Does um, does everybody have their student learning outcome instrument a, a part of their grade or is it just a additional activity that's used just for data collection? And you can respond if you have a microphone, you're welcome to turn on your microphone and respond or you can respond in the chat area. Are you referring to the SLOs separately? So I know that some faculty have a separate SLO in instrument, but what I see a lot more commonly is an embedding of the SLO content across the course as, as you go through. So it's not all a one and done document. I find that to be a little more effective with students as well than having just one thing that says, oh, here it is, and this is what you've done. I don't know about other people. I know in my courses, it's stated up front. They see, they know what the learning objectives are across the front, but then as we go to each lesson or each topic, each unit, whatever it may be, um, the ones that apply to those particular lessons or subject areas are then brought up front and saying, this is the learning objectives you're gonna hit um, with this material. <clears throat> question about, someone posted in the chat area, they have a question about quizzes. Um, what's your opinion on multiple attempt quizzes versus single attempt quizzes? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> what we like to call, or what I call quizzes, I call them, my quizzes are generally low stakes quizzes, meaning I have something gradable, a quiz or a test every week, all right? If it's not time to have a unit test or whatnot, then we have quizzes every week on the material that was covered for that week. I generally give my students four attempts on those quizzes. One, so they can use the quizzes if they need to, to, to repeat and redo and helpfully relearn. If they take it the first time, see where they scored low, they can look over the questions and retake it again. Now, it's not the exact same quiz. All my quizzes and all my tests are using a pool of questions. So when they take, I may have for a 25 question quiz, I may have 150 questions total. And for each topic area, I have at least four or five questions per each topic area. So the likelihood of a student getting the exact same quiz um, each time they take it is extremely low. Um, but again, we consider those low stakes quizzes. That's a good thing for students. Um, so they can, um, it's not just a one shot, oh my goodness, and, and they can't make it up or they can't um, do better on it. Um, but again, that's what, that's what we do in many of our courses here at, at Greenville Tech. Um, we encourage the use of what we call low stakes quizzes or low stakes grades, where it's checking their knowledge base. We can see what they're learning, what they're not. And if we need to review over a certain topic, we can see that. All right. That's a good, good statement. Someone said for formative assessments, I allow multiple attempts. For summative, I do not. Um, and I'm kind of that same way. Now, I will tell you this. I've been teaching online. Of course, we all been teaching online a lot lately, but um, for about 20 years. So what I generally do in my unit test, I tell my students up front, they have two attempts on their unit test, basically, which is their summative assessment for that particular unit. Um, however, I tell them, really, they only have one attempt. Why do I do two attempts? Because I'm teaching an online course, it's fully online, and guess what? 
you're going to have a technology problem. You're going to have a connection issue. You are going, it's not if you're going to have a problem, it's when, all right? That is two attempts. That second attempt is for the student, if they do have a technology error um, issue during the test, they don't have to wait on me to give them a second attempt because many of them wait till the last day that the test is due. And if it's due at midnight, they don't start the test until 11.45 p.m., all right? So what I tell my students is if this happens, if they have a technical issue during the test before they start their second attempt, they must send me an email and tell me what happened. Uh, and they don't have to wait for a response. I tell them because they may send me an email at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm not going to respond until the next day. So um, they can go and take it, but they have to do that. And then I will decide after I look at their first attempt um, if I will give allow that second attempt. Um, and again, there's pulling from a pool of questions. So the questions that they see um, on the first attempt will probably not be seen on their second attempt. But that's a good question. And, and I'm pretty strict about that. Students have tried to, to skirt that with me and I don't let it happen. And sometimes I tell them if they only miss the last two questions, I may drop those questions altogether and not count them and still take their first attempt. Um, so a student can't try to think they're gonna be able to scoot through while the questions may be, may be similar, they're different. They can scoot through and kind of get the idea and then take it the second time and, and do better. That's, I kind of shoot that down pretty quickly. Question, what's your opinion on multiple attempt quizzes with three attempts with the same 10 questions where all questions are given on all attempts versus only incorrect questions are required on subsequent attempts? Um, to me, that's a little hard to do. Um, if you're using D2L, I'm not sure of the settings there. I, I basically know with Blackboard, if we do that, um, it, there's no way for it to automatically do that, meaning to drop questions that they got correct. So they're gonna see if, they, if there's 10 questions on the quiz, they're gonna see all 10 every time. Um, that may be a little bit different. Um, now, if a student, you know, you, you kind of have to think about what a student could do. If you give them three attempts, they could go through the first attempt and get them all wrong on purpose, or maybe not intentionally, but they don't study and they get them all wrong. That way they see the question. Then they take it the second time and they have an idea of what questions are gonna be asked, especially if it's repeated every time. So they have studied those questions or gotten the answers for those questions and they may do much, much better. And then the third time they can pick up on the ones that they, they missed out on. So I think we have to be a little careful there um, that's why I like to use a pool of questions um, and they have to retake them. So even if they do take it multiple times, it's not exactly the same question. It's covering the same topics, but as far as math goes, that's easy for me to do because I can change the numbers and that sort of stuff. What you could do in other classes is if it's English, use different sentences, use a different paragraph, use a different type of activity that they're having to do. Um, biology, you know, ask different definitions if it's things like that, um, reword the questions differently. Um, so I, I think you have to be careful about giving multiple attempts if you're not modifying the questions between it. Um, but again, that's totally up to you. And if it's the low stakes quizzes, that may not be that big of an issue. Do I provide answers to quiz questions? Um, yes, and yes. With the test settings in Blackboard, I can show them the correct uh, answer and which answer they got incorrect, depending on the settings. Mary, yes, ma'am. I, I wanted to um, share something about providing answers to quiz questions, too, because it was related to the multiple attempt question. Right. W one of the things that I recommend to faculty, and we typically try to set it up this way, is in addition to having question pools, both DTOL and Blackboard allow you to obviously put in 
uh, feedback based on the wrong answers. Right. One of the things I encourage faculty to do is not give the actual answer, but tell them where to go to find it. So if you miss this question, rewatch the video in module two, because that way they actually have to go and look it up. They can't just type it in. They got to go look it up, come back and do that. And so we do that to force them because the bottom line is you want them to be able to answer the questions eventually and, and you want it to be something that's making them think. So rather than just giving the answer, send them to the place to find the answer. That's exactly right. Excellent suggestion. And I think that's that's a great way to do it. Any other thoughts or questions? All right. Well, I knew we were going to finish a little early. You know, we had a choice of 30 minutes or 50 minutes, and this could go either way. Um, but so we will finish a little bit early today in this session. Um, I appreciate all of you. I hope you all have a great rest of the day and good sessions. I have a session, another one at 3.30, but I've got to run off and do two other training sessions between now and then. Um, we kind of got double booked. Uh, so we are, we are doing training with our early college instructors as well. Um, so I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Enjoy the other sessions that you're going to be participating in. Um, and I hope you all have a great fall semester as well. You do the same.